Across the globe, millions are working to find solutions to a crisis that's been unfolding since the Industrial Revolution. Some of these solutions are gigantic, exciting and easy to see, but some are, well, a bit weird and tiny and don't make easy headlines. This is a film about one of those. We're making something capable of traveling this distance to be able to travel this distance makes such an enormous difference that it might just be of historic significance. And that solution? Light has always been something of a mystery. For centuries, physicists argued about whether it consisted of tiny particles too small to see, or whether it was, in fact, made of waves. Waves spread out through space, just like the waves on the surface of the sea. But particles are located at a particular place, like grains of sand or footballs. But in quantum theory, that's the branch of physics that's all about the way things work at the level of atoms and even smaller subatomic particles. Light has the characteristics of both waves and particles. It's composed of particles called photons, but these have wave-like properties and are spread out through space. Of course, light isn't just strange and therefore interesting. It's also the basis of all life on Earth. Plants collect solar energy through photosynthesis and grow. Now, the elements in the periodic table are almost all grey and colourless. So why do we live in a world of colour? The colours that we see are the result of the combination of different chemical elements to produce molecules that all interact with light in slightly different ways. The reason objects have colour is that molecules absorb some of the light spectrum, meaning they only reflect the remaining colours into our eyes. It's known from quantum theory that when light is absorbed by something, electrons in the thing's molecules move between energy levels, a bit like moving up a ladder. They absorb one photon per step on the ladder, and the colour of the photon that's absorbed is determined by the size of the step between levels. By changing the structure of the molecule somehow, we could change the size of the step between levels. So Prussian blue and ochre are both compounds of iron, but their chemical bonding is different, and so their colours are different too. Waves consist of a series of peaks and troughs, and the difference between two peaks is called the wavelength. Visible light has wavelengths in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers, blue to red. Chlorophyll absorbs at the blue and the red end of the spectrum, but not in the middle, so plants look green. There's one last thing you need to know about for the next bit of the film to make sense, and that's the power of nanoparticles. The electrons in tiny gold and silver particles have energies that are similar to those of visible light photons. So these nanoparticles absorb light very strongly, Photons get trapped at the metal surface in a region much smaller than the light's wavelength. This leads to strange effects such as really intense colours. In fact, it's possible to produce any colours of the rainbow using gold and silver, just by changing the shape and size of the nanoparticles and thus the different wavelengths of light absorbed. So, light, colour, nanoparticles, how does this all relate to the technology of the future? The answer to that can be found in nature. Everyone learns about photosynthesis in a really basic way at school. Could you explain it in more detail and why is it so important for our future? Well, the Earth is bathed in sunlight and just one hour of this energy would satisfy mankind's requirements for a whole year if we could just learn to harvest it and use it effectively. So we can take our inspiration from photosynthesis, which is the process that uses sunlight to convert atmospheric carbon dioxide into the food we eat while producing the oxygen that we breathe. So what's actually happening when light strikes a leaf? Well, when light strikes the leaf, the energy is absorbed by millions of chlorophyll molecules, 
which are held in place by protein scaffolds that allow the chlorophylls to create a network to capture the sun's energy, which can be quite scarce because sunlight is a dilute form of energy. Then the energy is converted into an electrical charge and then into a chemical form which can be stored by the plant and used to make the plant grow. The initial stages of photosynthesis that I outlined, the absorption of light, transfer of energy and the creation of electrical charge are nearly 100% efficient. So scientists would like to understand how this efficiency arises and apply it to a new generation of electronic devices, sensors and solar cells. Current solar technology is efficient and the cost is coming down all the time. But it needs to be improved in a range of ways if we're to truly live a net zero life. In an ideal solar panel, a layer of molecules that absorb sunlight would be sandwiched between two electrical contacts, one of which would be transparent. The molecular filling to the sandwich would capture light, which would trigger the formation of excited pairs of positive and negative charges, called excitons. These excitons would then migrate through the sandwich filling, eventually offloading charge at the contacts, leading to a flow of current. The problem is that excitons in molecular materials travel only very short distances, about 10 nanometers, before they recombine, cancelling each other out. Scientists have been trying to crack this one for 20 years or more. So earlier we heard about metal nanoparticles and their remarkable properties, and we heard about the beautiful proteins that nature uses in photosynthesis. And we found that when we combine the two of these, something new and very exciting happens. Um, what we found is that the properties of the proteins and the nanoparticles are mixed in a process that physicists call strong coupling. Normally when a photon, a particle of light, is absorbed by a molecule, it stays localised on that molecule, but in strong coupling, that photon becomes spread across many molecules. And we think this is important because it could hold the key to solving this problem about how to achieve efficient long-range transfer of energy in molecular materials. Obviously, we couldn't design a solar cell that was made out of proteins. What we're trying to do instead is to design synthetic materials, biomimetic materials that replicate the structures and properties of photosynthetic proteins for use in solar cells and many other kinds of applications. So Jenny, we've heard about photosynthesis and we've heard about strong coupling. But for someone new to all this, why does it all matter? And what is a breadboard? So this here is a breadboard that we use in the lab. And we use the holes to precisely put components where we want them to be. In our project, which is called Molecular Photonic Breadboards, we're hoping to advance technology that already exists. For example, the screen in your mobile phone is made of OLEDs. And the O stands for organic, which means that it's made of molecules. And these molecules are very similar to the molecules that are in photosynthesis. What you can't do with the current technology is decide where the molecules are in space. Within molecular photonic breadboards, we're looking at how you can control the orientation of those pigments synthetically, and then bringing in the strong light matter coupling to make something completely new. We don't understand the science of this yet, and we're making discoveries all the time within this project. And with new discoveries comes new technology, and that's just really exciting. So that's why molecular photonic breadboards are a big deal. It's a new way of using the properties of light, the process of photosynthesis, complex chemistry and quantum physics to help tiny pairs of electrons to travel just a little bit further inside our technology. And that small step for an exciton might just be the giant leap we all need.